All right, we're back. We are Comp 308. That's Emerging Technologies in the winter 2019 semester at Centennial. And we're week three, part two of our broadcast. We just finished talking about assignment one. And we're getting into uh, ExpressJS and EJS. Um, I have put a short hmm, a PowerPoint. It's not that short. It's about 82 pages that I'm not going to read all of um, throughout. I'm going to skip through it and talk about it at a high level. Um, but really, again, we're, we're, we're going with this book, uh, Mean Web Development. We're following the chapters in this book uh, as we're moving through it. Um, some parts have changed over the years. This is a book from 2016, 2015. So things have changed since then. Uh, but the process is roughly the same, right? So again, we're, we're talking about Express. We, last week, we talked about Node. And we made a very simple, silly Node. Node server that all it does is basically says, you know what? Welcome. Hello world. You know, you can ask me 10 questions and I'll keep telling you, I'll keep responding to you with hello world. We talked about this idea of request response. So you make a request. Again, this is just review and we we'll respond uh, with either a web page or information. We use, we're using the MVC model with the mean stack. We talked about that as well last week. And this week we're talking about another layer. It's a, it's kind of a layer, a middleware on top of node that basically helps us uh, do routing a little bit more efficiently. And it originally was something called Connect, another module, a project uh, that was created called Connect uh, that was modified heavily and eventually evolved into Express. OK, so some really cool stuff that we can do with it. Um, so what it does is um, Express really extends Connect. And what Connect does is it allows you to uh, do more efficient routing uh, and so on. And it's got a really cool, I've, I've kind of put the links up on Slack already, but the API documentation for it is fairly straightforward uh, because it's been developed so well. So here's Express.js. And if you look at the API docs, we're like, we're sitting at 4.16.4 .4 in terms of versioning. Uh, that's jumped up a lot since the last time these uh, PowerPoints were updated. Uh, but the concept is the same. So when we install stuff, um, when we do this, this is Express locally. So I can I can install Express locally, um, or I can use the Express generator globally. So I can use or install an Express application. We're going to start off by a local installation of Express. We're going to practice with a project, and then we're going to modify it later to use the Express generator to quickly scaffold out a um, a, a little framework for us to work with. OK, maybe framework is the wrong word, but it's something, a platform to work with. OK, so are we good? So what I'd like you to do is let's do this start. For, let's start with the tech and we'll get back to the PowerPoint as we go. OK, because again, PowerPoint, you can read for yourself. It's really background knowledge and, um, you know, to assist you with the understanding of what it is. And we're going to get back to that uh, as we go. So I'm going to make this little um, folder. Again, I always start with an empty folder if I can, or a folder from last week, even better. Uh, so it's comp 8 w 2019 and it's lesson 3B. Because of the B team, doesn't mean you're a bad team. Um, so 3B, um, what we're going to do is we're going to use Visual Studio Code, my favorite editor when it comes to web stuff, uh, to design what we're going to be doing this, this, uh, this week. And let's try that again. Okay, there we go. So we start off with an empty folder. And um, so with Express, just like Node, uh, there's a couple things I want you to start, start you off with. And I'm going to do some review. Here's some review. So if I want to start off a brand new Node or Express application, and I want to keep track of my dependencies, what's the first thing that I should do? How about the new guy that was, uh, that's was that been remote for all this time? What's the first thing that you would do? If you were going to start off with a brand new um, node or express application want to keep track of your dependencies what should I do starting off I've got an empty empty folder what would you do npm in it yeah so I'll start off with npm in it and node package manager in it what it does is it kicks off um, the uh, kind of a batch file that comes up and the batch file that comes up is a quick way of initializing our project we're going to override this later this is just at this point please we're just practicing I'm not going to put anything up, up on GitHub yet, OK? So we, we come up with this. You can see that it asked me for a version 1.0. My description is important, which is something like, you know, we're just doing an express uh, demo with it right now. 
My entry point is index.js. Um, maybe we'll make it server.js, because I think that's probably a better way of, of starting off as an entry point. Uh, my test command is, I don't have a test command right now. There's no Git repository. There's no keywords. My author, that's me. You can put your name. And my license, I keep at ISC. Is this OK? Yes. And so now that we've gone through it, you can see that my package.json file is like a manifest that keeps track of um, any kind of uh, development dependencies or uh, project dependencies. What's the difference between a pro project dependency and a development dependency? Come on, guys. I want you guys to talk with me. Let's not let's just not do this. Let's not make this a download today. Ryan, what I gotta bother you, right? Huh? What's that? Huh? You didn't ask. You didn't. You couldn't hear me. I said, "What's there was a development dependency and a and a project dependency? What's the difference?" It's not that. It's not a crazy trick question, huh? One is local. Okay. More. Anyone else? Yes. Perfect. I like that thinking. So yeah. So the answer was David answered that it's one is for the development environment. It makes your designing and and, and developing easier. Um, and that's true. You want to add anything else for yourself? What would be a difference between a dev dependency and a project dependency? I'm. I'm that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah why not? So you're, you're new. So I'm. Gonna, I'm kind of. Uh, you know. Yeah, get yeah. you. Get you involved. Tell me. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. So it's not the dev dependencies aren't necessary. It's just used for to help to help you develop better, right? And that's what it is. So think about a project dependency as things that I cannot live without. Example: If I was going to do Bootstrap, I need jQuery. It's a dependency. Um, if I'm going to include Bootstrap in my project, then Bootstrap is a dependency, or else I'm not going to have CSS that looks good, right? But you know what? Using, um, you know, a node like a, a types typing uh, for Java uh, for JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, just to make my life easier to give me better tooling uh, for TypeScript, that's not a that's not a project dependency. That's a me dependency. I want something to help me tool better, code better. Uh, that is a development dependency. Okay. So this is what this does. Project uh, the package.json does that as well as keep track of any uh, quick scripts. For example, inside of scripts, I can put, um, I can make a script called start. The start script is just going to be a shortcut where I can say something like, when I use start, I can do a, an npm or node, sorry, uh, server.js. It'll replace this, almost like a little uh, shortcut. So, and you can use other scripts in here, like build, uh, develop, deploy. You can do all kinds of other stuff in here that does, or test. You can do a test script that actually tests to see if you're, uh, and adheres to test-driven development methodologies. Uh, lots of other stuff that you can do, little scripts that you can run with NPM. So NPM start, we'll just do node server.js as an example. Um, so that's what this does. And what I want to do is I want to start installing all of our dependencies for uh, Express. So again, we said that Locally, we have to use npm install. You can also do npm i as a short form, npm i as opposed to npm install. And then the name of the package you want to install, in this case, it's express. And if it is global or local, if it's global, it's minus g. This is not global. And if it's local, we, can, we have to decide whether we want to include it or not, right? So if I say minus minus save, that is a project dependency. And minus minus save minus dev is a development dependency. So this is a project dependency. So it's express is going to be included. I can also at the same time, I can also include a development dependency for express and node. I can say, and I can do that all in one line. Last week, we kind of did um, node where I said, I want to include at types node and at types in this case, this week express. Remember, at types, what it does is it gives you code hinting and completion for Node and Express in Visual Studio Code. It extends Visual Studio Code in a way. And we want to say minus minus save minus dev for that one because it's a development dependency, both two. And if what it does is if you go back, you can see that um, your package.json file has been modified now automatically by the NPM, uh, Node Package Manager, where it has both 
uh, dependencies, a dependency property, as well as a dev dependency property that keeps track of all that stuff. Okay. So that's review from last week um, in terms of how to create a package.json file. Also note that when you do that, you also have something else called a package.lock-lock.json file, which includes versioning and a hash for each of your dependencies. We don't touch this file. We'll leave it alone. Okay. Um, so that's that one. Also, if we're going to put this up on GitHub, we're not. But if we're going to, I know that I'm going to have all these node modules. And these node modules are going to be hundreds, sometimes thousands of files that, that we don't want to put up on GitHub. Right? So we usually want to ignore them. And so I'm going to create a git ignore file for that. So a new file. And it's just uh, make sure it's in the right space, which I didn't. Uh -huh. There you go. And then dot git ignore. So the gitignore file, again, any anything you list, whether it's a folder or a file, in this case, it's the folder. So I just have to specify node modules, make sure it's spelled properly. As long as this is included, then when we go up on GitHub, it will be excluded. And look through this list and say, OK, we don't want to track node modules, this whole folder, recursively, which is pretty cool. All right, that's all you need to start. And then last week, we also started with a um, a server.js file. So let's start with that one. Server.js. Uh, there it is. Following the instructions online, if you go to the Express Getting Started, uh, installing or hello, let's do the hello world one uh, right now. Again, uh, if you notice, they're using um, best practices from ECMAScript 2015, 2016, the latest version. I'm just going to copy this part right here, and we're going to go through what each of them, each of the pieces do. I go back to here and paste. And let's talk about this a little bit. Again, I'm using const and let and not var. OK, now some people don't care about that kind of stuff. Uh, I do care. I want you guys to use uh, const and let. Var, again, we have this idea of hoisting. Not so much in um, on the node side, but it's just more modern and slick. I, I like to use semicolons. Some people don't. Um, new specifications say you don't need to. And it's like they're following uh, modern languages like uh, Swift from Apple that doesn't require any semicolons to separate your commands. I'm more of a traditionalist. So I like to use semicolons. So that's why I put them in. You don't have to as long as your stuff works. I'm good. All right. So now the great thing about code hinting is if I hover over, I get some idea of what I'm doing. You can see that the first line, just like before, we use the require statement. What does that do again? What does require? What, what is it like in other languages? an import or an include or a using. It's kind of similar in different languages, right? So that's what this does. And when we import, we actually make a reference. We store a reference to this module, if you will, inside of this identifier. So Express has a reference, some kind of numbered reference, uh, usually some kind of ad address reference, right, to this module, right? So Express represents this module. It's like as if I'm using this module, right, With when, when I use the keyword Express. And now I do another one. I say, well, app then is equal to express, but express with brackets, which means I'm actually calling the constructor on express. So I'm saying, it's like I'm saying app is equal to a new express application. That's what it is. A new, think about the phantom new keyword, or what I could be using as something like uh, a factory, the factory design pattern, which is like, I want to create a new express application, and I want to store a reference to it as an object inside the app identifier, right? And the app identifier, this app, it's not a variable because it's a constant. It's not going to change. Is something that I'm going to be using throughout the application, right? I also make a port. In this particular case, it's 3,000. We know uh, if this was a TypeScript file that this would be cast as a implicitly cast as a number. That would be the type number. Last week when we talked about TypeScript, we talked about basic types, number, string, and there's others, um, bool, and, and so on. Um, and, and then once we have the port, we have this new command. It's app.get. App.get is using something called uh, routing. There's different parts of it. If I hover over, there's there are three different overloads by default. So one of the main ones is this one. I have some kind of path string. That's the first part. And then I have this funky syntax. What is this funky syntax? What does it represent? Do you remember? Arrow function. It's an arrow function. Fat arrow function, and it represents. How do I rewrite this in the old world? 
yeah, so I'm going to do one of these. Old world, it's, it, it's like this, function and then curly brace, right, kind of thing. What's something that looks like this where I, you know, kind of encapsulate this in a curly brace and it would look something like this on another line or, sorry, let me just do that again, uh, where this is an inline callback, you know, something that looks like this, right, where I do something that looks like this, let's say. And maybe you can put it, I'm just going to try and realign it. So this is what it would look like, inline callback, right? You could definitely definitely write it this way and notice that there's two parameters. There's a request parameter and a response parameter. Notice that the request parameter is grayed out because we're not actually doing anything with the request. We're just passing along the request into the app, uh, the express app. That's what this app uh, identifier is. It represents that. And we're using the get method that's built into the, the express application to, um, do a get request. Um, I, and there's different kinds of requests I can make. A get request, a post request, a put request, a delete request, right? And depending on the type of request, um, it can, your server can respond with different data, right? In this case, what we're doing is we're responding, we're sending some, a message back that's hello world. And let's do it right. Hello comma world is the way to do it. If you're gonna be, you know, for, for uh, completeness, right? There we go. So this is our this is your first route. This is kind of an example of routing. And this is very simple. So basically the forward slash like this, it represents the root of your, your folder, right? So if I'm going to go to www.tom.com, if I had that um, domain, that'd be awesome. But no. Um, and I would go to, that would be the, the, uh, the root. This represents the root, this symbol, right? Um, and every time I go there, I'm going to get this response. Hello, world. It's not going to be an HTML5 response. It literally is going to be a text response, which is, again, as useless as last week, right? But the idea is you can route. Then further down, you have your app, your Express app, and you're going to use the listen method on a particular port. That's, the re that's what's required here. You can see that uh, this is what we're really looking at. It includes things like your HTTP module that's, that's part of Node. Um, and it creates a server. As soon as I listen, it's like a server that's built into the application gets called. And we create an event listener to listen for requests on that particular server. But remember, the app represents the instance of the express server as soon as it's created. OK? And then we're using fat arrow syntax. Again, to replace this, you would put in old school function. And then you replace the fat arrow with curly braces. So it'd be something that looks like this. So just in case, you know, you look at a pharaoh and you're like, what does this do? Try doing this first. Try breaking it down into the old school way of, of, of thinking, and then it might open up an understanding of what's of what's required. So this is a um, an event handler uh, that listens for uh, or does well, uses an event callback that when it's listened to, it, it tells you that the example app is listening on a particular port, whatever it is, OK? running this thing. So now that we have the code here, um, how do we run it? I recommend, again, using Nodemon. Uh, we briefly talked about it last week, but let's talk about it again this week. Nodemon is a uh, node uh, module, and it's something we can use globally. So the way we install it is npm install nodemon minus g. Um, remember last week, whenever we made a change to our server, we had to stop the server and restart the server, which is a real pain from a workflow perspective. We don't want that. What we want is Nodemon to restart the server every time there's a server-related change. And what I mean by that is any routing or, you know, the server structure itself, the files for the server. Is a server-related change, Nodemon will restart the server. Now, if you don't like that, if you like ultimate control, then you could do it on your own. The challenge is, this is the questions I get. Tom, I don't know why, but my thing is not working. Did you restart the server? No. Oh. And, it, and it's the common thing we talk about. It's almost like, uh, I don't know why, but my computer doesn't work. Did you plug it in? I mean, it, it's like, I know it's silly, but it's like, I'm telling you, it's like when you're doing TypeScript. I don't know why, but I did it in TypeScript. It's great. Did you transpile? Right? And these are simple things, but it can be a pain in the ass in terms of workflow. Right? So we try and make it as simple as possible. So I do this. Even if I'm installed, like I installed Nodemon this morning, it'll reinstall it and there'll be no negative effect for the most part. 
What I mean by that is if like some kind of change happened, they put a change this afternoon and, and it broke, then it, it's going to break, right? But for the most part, if you install NodeMon this morning and this afternoon, it's just going to rewrite or overwrite the stuff and there's no, no negative effect. Um, so what NodeMon allows us to do is, um, again, it depends on what you've written in your uh, package.json. So your package.json file specifies the entry point, right? So main is server.js and NodeMon has quite a few options on it. So if you just type the word NodeMon, what it does is it launches the app at the entry point, right? And notice that it's here, it says, okay, re to restart at any time, press RS. So it's an actual working kind of little program. Let's try and see what that looks like. So if I go up to my local host and I go to 3000, I can see now in the top left corner of my screen, hello world, not really that exciting. Uh, but here's where the change is compared to last week. Last week, no matter what I did, it, it responded with hello world, right? This week, if I go slash index.html, it's gonna respond with, I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, cannot get, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no index to HTML. And the reason for this is because Express doesn't know, uh, there's no valid route to get to index.html, right? And so because there's no valid route, we're not gonna produce one. Um, notice I didn't have to restart the server, but if I was to change something, let's say I went to my server.js and I changed it from hello world to goodbye world, like this, by we'll call it uh, cold world. Today is a really cold day. At least when I got here this morning, it was like minus twenty. Um, if I break a change, if I make a change, if I save this, watch what happens here. It automatically restarts the server, right? Which is cool. And then if I respond, I, re I refresh. It's still going to be an error. Uh, if I refresh and go back to the root, then you're going to see now it's goodbye cold world as opposed to uh, hello world. One way also what we like to do is um, when I'm at home, I have a larger monitor. From a workflow perspective, I like to break my screen into different parts. Um, I'm going to use this just temporarily. It's a pain in the ass sometimes when we produce this because I really don't have a lot of real estate and I want to be able to get you to see what I'm doing. When I do this, uh, the bad thing is that um, this is compressed, so you get a bit of um, responsiveness in the app, which I want most times. But now what's going to happen is it's going to, use, it's going to give me the hamburger and a bunch of other stuff that I don't want to see. So here you can see goodbye crew world. If I was to change this, so if I go back to hello world now, similar to what we did with light server, um, if I did this, hello world, save it and just refresh, you can see that it's instantly changed. I don't have to go and restart the server. The server has been restarted for me. So this is an advantage for you. That's why I use NodeMod. Questions around this. So this is very similar to what we did with um, Node, but you can see that there's simplicity here. There's no HTTP that I'm, not, I'm requiring here, it's handled on the Express side. So Express handles HTTP requests, uh, path requests. It includes anything you need. It's, built, it's kind of uh, plugged in and built in. Um, and that's what this part does. Notice you can also do some other things. Um, I don't have to use app.get forward slash. I could also use app.get star. What do you think the difference is before trying? What do you think this would do? I did app.get star as opposed to forward slash. How about some guys on the other side of the room? Brian, what do you think? Hmm? Guess. Doesn't matter. What do you think the star would do? What's star in programming? It's a it's like a wild card, right? Okay, so if it's a wild card, then you can figure that if anything that I put in will give me hello world now. Not just uh, the root, but even if I go do something like this and go index.html, now we're back to the stupidity from last week. If I say index.html, it's going to say hello world. If I say, you know, gobbledygook, it's going to say hello world. It'll keep on answering hello world no matter what I say. So this is like a catch-all root that'll catch everything and return the same thing over and over again. Here's the thing. Don't put this at the beginning of your routing table, right? If you put this at the beginning of your routing table, then the other, it'll ignore the rest of them. <laughs> that would be very bad. So um, you can make multiple routes. So we can start off with something that looks like this. And if I would create a couple of routes like this, let's say I copy pasted. So here's the second route, here's the third route. And let's make this one about. And instead of hello world, we're gonna say about page. And you know what? And this will be um, contact. And we can say something like, you know, don't call me. Something different, right? All right, so don't call me. You wanna contact me? No. 
and let's just do something like this so it works. There we go. Okay, so something that makes it a little different. You know that there's three different responses. I got a forward slash about and contact. Notice that I'm not putting about.html or contact.html. You don't have to do that. And if I go back up here and I kind of put that in, if I say something like about, then I get about page. And if I go in here and I do contact, don't call me, right? And if I put something else entirely that I haven't accounted for, like, for example, slash, uh, you know, I don't know, Spider-Verse. Then I get, I don't know what you're talking about. I get, cannot get, right? Because I have a program for that. Now, what about if I do this? If I put in my wildcard at the end, like this. So I take this part and kind of go in here and put a wildcard like this. So kind of get rid of all this stuff. This in there. And then maybe something, you know, some other answer. Like maybe you've you've run into a problem or something like that, right? So let's see what happens. Like if I so Spider Verse now, if I do this and I go enter, it's like some other answer. But what if I go and do the other ones? What if I say, well, I have an answer. It's the about page. Do I get about? Yes. So putting the wildcard at the back, it's okay, right? Because it's going to try and do your other routes first, and then the wildcard will be hit last if the other routes don't uh, don't make any sense. If this does not compute, it's going to do the wildcard. So this is like a catch-all, like I said. OK, so this is kind of some basic ideas of how to do routing with Express. Um, but there's some really good documentation here. If I go to the guide that's on the Express website and I hit routing, then it's going to give you some examples about um, how to do it. It's going to talk about the same things that we did already. It'll also talk about using app.get or app.post for different kinds of responses. A good example of this, if I have a contact page, I might do app.get for my contact page to actually display the actual contact page itself, right? Is that a hand? Tell me. For your, you could use it for exceptions. You can use it as a catch-all, like you've landed on the wrong page. Oops, I don't know where you, uh, why you're here kind of thing. Typically, we won't. Typically, we have an error page that comes up, a 404. Custom 404 is better, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, you could use this as well. You could say, like, OK, I don't know where you're going. This, the page is, maybe the page is looking for is moved, you know, one of those kind of things. Uh, and you can do other things in here. You can kind of, sub, you know, kind of like uh, parse what, what they're trying to do and try and figure a little bit more of what your response is, is going to be. Here, uh, we have get and post, and it's the same route. So like I said, so if this was like the contact page and I use get, I'm going to get the page. I'm actually going to see the contact page, maybe the contact information, the little web form that I'm asking you for, and maybe the submit button, and some navigation and stuff like that. But when I click the submit button, then the post request will be activated on the same page. So the page URI is not going to change, right? It's still going to be the contact page, as an example, in, that, in this particular example that I'm using. Uh, but the type of request is going to change. So instead of a get request, you're going to make a post request. And the post request usually entails clicking that submit button. And you want to process the form. That's what you're going to do here, right? So when I, I process the form on the contact page. So you can do that too. You can break it up into get and post and put and delete. You can also use the all catch all. So you say for all types of get requests or requests in general, I want something to happen first. And then you can layer them. You can say, OK, for all requests, I want to do this. I want to display this. And for the rest of them, I want to do, well, for get, one, for get requests, I want to do this. For post requests, I want to do that. And you have a lot more control. They talked about some other kinds of characters you can use. Be able to use the, um, the star, which is, is kind of like a, uh, you know, kind of a wild card um, character. And there's other characters that they use for um, a kind of splitting up or uh, addressing your your URI a little differently. And they give some examples here. So there's the slash, the about page, some random text. Now, this is interesting. It says random text. The root path will match request to random text. OK, cool, right? So this is the actual thing. And it says random.text. Curious, is this going to return uh, the file random.text or the string random.text? What do you think? It's just a string. 
So the file will not be returned at all, in fact. And, and that's kind of a weird thing when you, you, you expect it to happen. And if you hover over the send, you see what it can do. Send does uh, a new buffer, some kind of uh, JSON. Uh, it could be uh, a templated uh, uh, HTML. So if you want to send a template, you can do that. It can also send a status code like 404 and some kind of, of message. All right. So these are the things that it can do. Notice that there is no file option to load and display a file like index.html. This doesn't do that, right? At least not from this. All right, so that's what this does. Um, you can see that there's question marks in terms of, it says this route path will match A, C, D, and A, B, C, D because of the question mark. So it's almost like using a regular expression. Um, and there's other options that I'm not gonna go into right now. Um, anything with an A, right? You can create specific paths uh, that match certain patterns, right? Uh, and especially things like this, where you wanna match something that ends in fly, right? Um, you know, as an example, whether it's butterfly or dragonfly, but not butterfly man or dragonfly man, because um, they don't end in fly, they have fly inside of them, right? Which is kind of interesting. Uh, different root parameters, this is interesting too. If you use a colon uh, next to some kind of parameter, that means it's a root parameter. So I want to find the user ID. Let's try this out. So again, I'm going to do this. Copy this and paste this thing here. And let's just make this a user. So we'll say user, and then we go slash, and then ID, right? So I want to look at the user ID. I want to return the user ID. And let's suppose that um, I want to, instead of res send, I want to, uh, I want to uh, respond with a set of parameters. So a res send request parameters. So down here, I'll say request params, right? So the request object is now being used. I'm taking the request object and displaying it in my message that I'm sending back to the user. So whatever you give me, I give back to you. Let's try it. So I save this. If I go back out to localhost and I go in here and I say something like user and then slash 25, and I press enter, you're going to get ID 25. So it'll give it to you right back. Like it, it'll record uh, whatever you give it in the URL. So let's say if I want user 25, I want to book book number 567, you know, whatever it's going to be, a report, an order, or something. You can do that very simply. What are you going to ask? In this case, because I'm sending the request parameters, typically we won't do this. We'll break it up. We'll use body parser or something else to break up the request. Uh, and then uh, display it in other ways, whether it's directly on a page, or I can respond like this in with uh, JSON. Okay, so that's definitely some stuff we can do. This is using app.get still. We're not into the, the routing yet. Actually, I wanted to go back there. Here we go. So that's what this does. Um, and there's other ones. You can use multiple ones. You can also use a from and to. So I go from and then dash to. Then I can say that it's from LAX to San Francisco as an example. And then when you're rec params, they'll say something like this. So kind of very straightforward. Um, so there, this is useful because we're going to see this later on when we do user ID. Uh, when you log in and authenticate, you'll have a user ID. You might have an order ID or something like that. We can use the uh, colon and variable name as something that's part of the URI, URI that we can utilize in terms of calculation uh, or trying to identify what you're doing. All right, um, they're talking about Express 5 here. Uh, route handlers in terms of how to handle uh, routing and how to uh, uh, combine objects. So it says more than one call by function can handle a route. Make sure you specify the next object. All right, so here's something that's interesting. So I have the get request. And by default, the first uh, handler is going to be this one. And then if I use next, then I can do the next if, the next handler, and I can do as many of these event handlers as I want in order. Now, that gives you some interesting effects. For example, I can also do a handler and an error handler as one of these handlers. So I can have multiple handlers, including an error handler that calculates if I do get an error, do, what kind of error do I get? Can I respond with a specific custom error message or something like that, or other kinds of functionality? Again, this is used to solve problems this kind of thing, right? Where 
I want to respond multiple times with different kinds of things. And that's what the next uh, parameter is for. You have to include it. And then what it does is it jumps to the next uh, callback. You can also have an array of callback functions. That's something else that you may want to do. Um, and that's fine. You can have, so there's your array of callbacks. So you do one, the first one, the second one, and the third one in order, in that order, uh, that you do every time you hit that particular um, route. And that's kind of interesting. Different kinds of response methods. So uh, most common one are that we've seen so far is res end, res send, res send file, res render. Res render is what we're going to be using a lot with the express generator. So we're going to render, draw the view. And the, but you need to have a view engine specified when you set this up. Okay, so I'm just looking at the API documentation here uh, with you guys. App root. Okay, so app root is also uh, something that we're going to use more than just an app.get or app.post uh, kind of thing. App root gives us additional um, chainable root handlers that we can use, which is pretty cool. So it kind of combines some of the other ones that we saw, like the all function, into like something that's chainable. Like, okay, I want to use this root, but I want to have, I want to be able to do the get, so display it. I want to process it and I want to update it. That's what it does. Okay, so these kind of three handlers that are totally different. Again, a lot of this stuff is was designed for flexibility and for problem solving. Like you have a problem you need to solve, and wouldn't it be nice if I had this extra callback that I could do this? When I completed this callback, I do the next one in order. Yeah, here it is. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be doing things asynchronously, and sometimes you don't know which callback is going to trigger, right? Uh, so that's what uh, this kind of solves as well. So then, so then um, you know, they go more into it. Uh, here, we've created an express object again, right? An express reference, sorry. And then what we use is we use the a new router. We create a new router with express dot router. So this is similar to what we did when we made we made an app. An app includes other things like a router, but a router is very specific. So it does um, a smaller set of functionality than the app uh, component, right? And it specifically does things like with just routing. Sometimes, and you'll see this in the express generator, uh, the router is is uh, instantiated in a whole different file, in a module. Remember last week we talked about modules briefly? We said that in, in module pattern, we use the module pattern for uh, Node, or even in modern ECMAScript 2015, 2016, that each file can be considered a container for that particular module, right? And if we include whatever we attach to the module, with module.export, as an example, we attach whatever we want, whether it's a function, whether it's the whole class, something, we attach it to the module, and we can make a reference to it outside of that particular um, file. So here's a good example. Imagine if I have a, in this case, they called the, the router file birds.js. Not sure why they would call it birds. Maybe it's all about birds, right? Um, yeah, so the birds homepage, about birds, right? So you make a special birds.js, and notice this is a file. And what you're doing is at the end, you're attaching the router object. So you define the router object up here. You use the router object there. You define two roots for the router object here. And once you've done that, you attach it to the exports object. And now it's available in some other file if I want to do routing. And usually we attach it to something like the app.js file or the server.js file. So we can uh, call this particular route when we want to do some um, routing. One of the confusing parts for beginners when it comes to routing, because they've never had to do it before, is why do I need to do it? Why do I need to bother? Why don't I just automatically route whatever I want? Um, it's a complicated answer, because what you what in the past what you're used to is with automatic routing um, is kind of like you're looking at a folder and you're routing everything. Here, when you don't do automatic routing, just like in MVC, with .NET, you can lock down parts of your site. You can make part of it um, secure or part of it public. You can um, have more control when you don't automatically route everything that's in your, inside your site. On the downside, you have to create a routing table and you have to manage it. Management can be uh, real challenging and there's some uh, strategies around what to automatically route and what to like static create static routes as well as some of these named routes, depending on what you want to do. But think about this. Imagine if I had all these files on the server. I have an index.html. I have a contact.html. I have an about.html. 
and I have, uh, you know, some kind of products that HTML. And if I ask for uh, um, something else like services that HTML, but I don't have a route for it, it's going to give me an error saying, don't know what you're talking about. Even if the file exists, you have to almost like create a one to one map between the routing table and the file in your server. Um, so that's what this this thing does. This is that's what Express does for us. It allows us to do custom routing to connect with our with our files. Okay. Um, and I don't want to bore you with too much more of this, but this is kind of the pretty cool API that um, documentation. Res.json I've used a lot. Yes. Sorry. It's for any module. It does exports, module.exports. It attaches any function or uh, object to the, to the actual module itself, and it exports it. It creates a reference to it in another module. And the reason for this is because in a regular web application, you have index.html. You can link everything together in the browser cache. Here, there's no browser. You just have a, you know, a file that you're connecting dependencies to. And you reference. Um, okay, so here's something. Um, sometimes you want to return JSON, only JSON. And going back to if you want to use an Angular front end as an, an example, we may want to consume the data uh, from a Mongo Express and Node site. So I have two sites. I have Mongo Express and Node. It's almost like a service. If I want to create a microservice, we're talking about microservice later on. That's all it does. It connects to the database and returns data. But I have no front end at all. You can't get to it even. But Angular, what it does, it knows you know, the back end uh, endpoints, if you will. And it uses Angular's framework as a front end to consume the data that comes into Angular through a service. And what it does, it consumes the JSON data that it gets from the express routing. Now, it sounds really complicated, but actually it's not. It's just that you don't see it happening in the background. So a service in Angular literally will go to that URI and read the data in JSON format from the Express server. And then it can use that data to do whatever it does, whatever Angular does, which is kind of cool, right? Um, so yeah, JSON we use we use quite a bit. Where, where we want to use a, you know, um, again, a RESTful service that we want to create on the Express side. Okay, questions around that? I know you guys are spacing out because you don't know what you're, what I'm talking about until you actually do it, right? But I got to talk about this a little bit because this is where you want to get some, your API documentation is mostly here for Express. Um, there's also the API reference, which is a more complete reference on all the stuff uh, that is uh, Express. Uh, we don't always need everything, but sometimes we want to do a quick lookup uh, how does this particular thing work? How does it connect? What's the syntax? All that kind of stuff. Um, anything you need is pretty much in here uh, to make things go. And Express is so well known and used. There's a ton of help files. If you want to look up Google Stack Overflow, all, well, all that stuff has tons of things on, on doing things with Express. OK, um, let's move on to the Express generator. So I got Express. I'd have to code everything manually, and I want to get some advanced functionality. OK, so I want to wipe out my file now. Well, this, this is a nice idea. We're just using it for practice. Now, however, I want to create a brand new uh, file. And I want to talk about the Express generator before we use it. So, And you're going to say, well, why not Express? Why Express generator? Why not just do things with Express? And we can do it kind of a little bit more lightweight. Well, there's a couple of tactics. You gonna take off? Sorry. You leaving? Yeah. It worked out. Yeah. Right. So the Express Generator does this. You use, uh, you download and install the Express Generator this way. It's a global installation. We're gonna do that in a second. And then what you do is you say Express, any kind of options, and the directory you want to kick off your application. You can specify the type of view engine. In this uh, course, we're gonna be using the EJS view engine. It's a little easier than Pug to learn, I find. But there's other ones. You can use handlebars, which is also pretty popular, and others. And what's, what is a view engine? A view engine is instead of us getting an index.html page or an actual HTML page that we read and we produce online, we, we generate it, uh, we actually create the view by getting information 
and almost like um, we can embed uh, JavaScript in the page and make it more dynamic. We can also split the page and create almost like a single page application without using something like Angular or React. So think about the, the uh, days before React and Angular where we didn't have a front end framework at all. You had things like handlebars, which are just like, you know, double curly braces. They look like handlebar mustache, right? Um, that's where it came from. And um, EJS, which is an actual very popular framework, which is very similar to um, uh, .NET, actually, and PHP, right? Where you can inject JavaScript inside of your HTML page. Now, there's a lot of opinions about this. It's bad. It's not component-based. It's not maintainable, uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but it's great learning uh, when you start uh, doing this. So that's the... Um, that's kind of like the uh, the way Express works in terms of how you install the Express generator. Uh, what it will look like when you say Express uh, dash dash whatever the view engine is, and then the uh, uh, folder, it'll generate a bunch of stuff. You'll have to do an npm install on the folder because it's not going to actually install any of the npm modules. It's just going to literally just in, uh, kick off your package.json and create your folders for you. So, like I said, a scaffold. It'll create your structure for your for your website very, very quickly, right? And then this is the kind of structure it's going to create. Some of this is OK. Some of it we're going to discard, right? But we're going to use a very similar structure to this one with some different naming conventions, OK? In here, you have uh, your app.js, which is where most of the linking and um, the connections are going to happen. www, and I know why they did this, um, but I typically take this out of here and rename it to server.js because that's what it is. It's the server.js file that they buried inside the bin folder. All right? So not really happy about this. I, I typically take it out and rename it and pull it out to the, to the root of the folder. And so I have two parts, server.js and the app.js. The server.js is literally all it does is that. It just listens for connections. The app.js does all the work for you, OK? We have your package.json, your uh, public folder that includes images, JavaScripts, and style sheets. Public folder is going to be part of the path, so you don't have to include the public keyword at all when it comes to routing. Uh, I'll show you how to do that. And we're going to rename some of this stuff because it's named incorrectly. But the idea for this horizontal structure is correct. Okay. Um, routes. Routes folder is going to inc include two files, one that's index.js for your main routes, as well as a users.js if you had users. We don't have users. Eventually, we're just going to delete this. There won't be a users.js file. Um, and the views file, where we are going to show uh, all of the view templates. So again, think about each of the views, not as an uh, HTML page necessarily, but as a template that we can inject content inside of through the use of uh, JavaScript. Okay, Kind of similar to what we do with uh, React, but in the other way around. Instead of, instead of in, uh, injecting HTML uh, with React, we actually inject uh, data with JavaScript which is kind of a weird thing. Um, anyways, and you can see here that you have an error and an index and a layout. Um, here it's pug, which is the standard way of using uh, e um, Express. We're not going to use pug, so it's going to say error.ejs, index.ejs. That's going to be our structure for the most part. All right, let's do it. So a couple of ways to do this. Um, one thing I've done in the past is I've deleted, which I did this morning, Kind of the stuff we did in here this literally was just for you guys to uh, practice that's what this stuff was um, we're going to replace it with the um, express generator one thing to note is my git ignore file is not going to change so i don't have to delete everything right my package.json will change my server will change my node modules probably going to change so i can just delete them so if i just go delete and it may not allow me to because i'm currently using it in my Visual Studio Code. So here's my Visual Studio Code. I got, may have to close this down is what I'm saying. So I can delete my package, my node modules. I can delete uh, everything else except for my gitignore file, which I'm going to reuse. Right? Um, let's just delete those. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to reopen this up in Visual Studio Code. So here's Visual Studio Code. All I have now is my gitignore file with node modules like this. OK? If I press Control-Back-Tick, I bring up my terminal. 
Um, and what I want to do here is install the Express Generator. And like I showed earlier, the Express Generator is installed like this, npm. Did I just type npm in there? Thank God. OK, npm i for install express dash generator and then minus g for global. So what this does is it takes the express generator files and install, installs it in the global namespace that you can use on any command line um, that's, uh, that's, been, that's open on your system. All right, cool. So now that I have that, I can do it. There's two ways I can do it. I can go to the desktop and go express minus e and a brand new app folder, whatever I call it, my app folder. Or I can do it in here. I can just go express minus e, no folder name. That's an option. And it's going to say, hey, are you sure? Warning that this thing isn't completely empty. And I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead. When I do that now, if you notice, I have a bunch of these folders. We're going to fix this up. I still have my git ignore file, which I need anyway. And what I want to do here is, are you good with me? Are you still? OK. Um, I have these folders, right? So I, I like the the uh, the other folders, but bin's got to go, right? So I'm going to take the www file, take a look at it. The www file actually is my server.js file. So what I want to do is rename this first. So we'll call it server.js. And I'm going to take this thing and drag and drop it out into the root of the folder. Please do this with me. So I'm going to take this and go whoop. And it's going to say, hey, Update imports for move the file server JS. This is a great thing about Visual Studio Code, man. Right? You move things around, it'll detect it and it'll ask you to update all the pathing. Right? I'm gonna say absolutely do it. And what it's gonna do is when I move it out, it changes line seven on uh, in the server JS file. Normally it had a double dot here, so it went up a level. Now it's not up a level, it's in the same level with dot app. So it's working immediately, which is kind of cool. All right. Uh, again, I love Visual Studio Code. I think it's got some really cool functionality, and that's why I use it. So yeah, if you can see that now, I've got my server.js here and my app.js here. Package.json is kind of sparse. We're going to fix this up too. Um, I'm going to do it by using the um, batch file. So I'm gonna, again, I'm going to say control backtick, and I'm just going to do another npm init. You can do this as many times as you want. And what it does, it reruns the batch file. So I can say, OK, I like my package name but I don't like my version number. I want 0 .0 0.0.1, let's just say. My description is going to be express generator demo. You can call it whatever you want. It's important that you add it in. My entry point will not be app.js. It'll be server.js, which is where it's going to go, right? My Git repository I don't have. My keywords I don't care about right now. My author, that's me. And I can keep my license and everything else, and that's pretty cool. And I'm good to go. So I've updated my package.json file at this point. Notice that I got these little curly green lines here in package.json, and Visual Studio Code is just trying to help me, saying, hey, you've got these as dependencies, but there's no node modules folder here. You need to do something. And we need to do a, a node uh, or npm install. So if I go control backtick, and I go here, uh, I can just do an uh, npm install. And what that'll do is it'll install all the node modules that are listed inside of my package.json file. OK? Pretty straightforward stuff. And so now all of this, these dependencies, have been installed in my node modules folder. OK? I still think it's important to install dev dependencies for this. Like, I still want body parser, a uh, dev dependency for that. Um, cookie parser, a dev dependency for that. Um, sometimes I need to use those. I express for sure, node, um, you know, those kind of things are really, I think it's important to install. And you get code hinting on that stuff. Any kind of tooling for me is good tooling, right? So it's another little installation, but I think it's worth it. So let's do it. So again, um, <clears throat> I want to do something like this. I want to say that I want to do an npm install, and I want to do at types, like we did before, express at types uh, node at types cookie dash parser at types body dash parser at types morgan these are all modules that are part of the express generators framework and then at the end minus minus save minus dev 
That's what it looks like. I'll give you a second to look at it. And if I want to include other things like jQuery, I'm going to include jQuery and Bootstrap and everything else today in this one, one, one module. I'm going to create this whole thing. Then I'm probably going to ask for those things too later. But for now, this is good. I'm going to press Enter, and it's going to go up, grab all those modules that I want from the web and install them as uh, development dependencies in my project. OK? So what this does is, what this does is it, inside node modules now I have not just dependencies, but also dev dependencies, um, which are pretty cool. All right, let's take a look at my bin. I don't need my bin anymore, so I can delete it. Let's just get rid of it. So no more bin. All right, um, public. Let's look at public. Um, I don't like the way this is named. I'd like to name this assets. So I'm going to add a new assets folder under, under the public folder, capital A. Again, I'm adhering with the capitals to Microsoft standards, so you can use this with Microsoft's uh, .NET as well as with, um, you know, uh, Node and Express and so on. So assets images. Again, uh, it's not going to put up an empty folder. So if we leave images alone, it's going to it's not even going to go up to GitHub. But for us, we want to kind of include it. JavaScripts. I'm going to rename again my JavaScripts uh, folder to um, scripts. And there's multiple reasons for this. One thing I'd like to do immediately is add a simple empty script, app.js. And I'm going to put a little bit of code that says uh, custom uh, JavaScript. I have a script. It goes here. OK, that's what that is. And that's in my scripts folder. And in my style sheets, I'm going to rename my style sheets again uh, to content. And I'm going to rename my style.css to app.css because it makes more sense. Okay, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. I don't want any of this uh, CSS right now. I'm just going to say something like uh, custom CSS goes here. right? So if you want to add some custom CSS, modify Bootstrap or whatever we're going to use, that's, what, that's where you put this. So that's my public folder. My public folder is literally going to be all client-facing technologies not including the views. They're not going to be in here. They're going to be probably going to be in here. Now, if you're doing things with Angular, you might have a public folder, and maybe you're going to do everything with Angular in the public folder. It's up to you. There's a lot of, lot of ways of combining things together, right? Or keeping two separate projects that one's connecting to the other one uh, through routing. All right, so, um, so here's public routes. Pretty good. Um, Index.js and user.js. Uh, I don't need both of these. I'm going to get rid of one eventually. And here's my views. Now, we need to do some cleanup. Let's start with server.js. Server.js has vars, which are dreaded. The dreaded var is still here. We're going to get rid of them. So we're going to do a control F, and we're going to search for var, and we're going to replace with let, right, at the very minimum. If you look at this uh, other button right here, it replaces all of them. So all vars. The dreaded vars have been replaced with lets, right? Which is a lot better. Uh, one thing to check is to go through and make sure that there's nothing weird. Like sometimes they make something like my variable, and then of course it's my let er, right? Because it'll replace var with let. Uh, in this case, it probably won't. So I think we're good. And I'll do the same thing in my app.js underneath my uh, root. So root app.js up here. Notice there's a bunch of vars. I'm going to do the same thing, but kind of. Um, Find var and replace with let. So all of those are going to be replaced. OK, so I've done that. And there's one other place I'd like to do that, which is inside of my index.js and my routes folder. Do the same thing. So control F, I'm going to search for var and replace with let. There's only two replacements. All right, so I've done all that work. Again, this is all just structuring, structuring the way I want my, my app to look. OK? And now that I've got all this working, and I really don't, I want to test out what's, what my Express JS, a basic framework is going to look like. And I want to put this up on GitHub, right? So again, I'm going to go control back tick. I'm going to do clear. And I'm going to say node mon. And if I did everything correctly, then I'm going to get this, which is starting node JS. Ryan, the other guy, right? right. Did you make, did it work? All right. Um, yeah, last week with Ryan, we made it work, and I just move, move desk again, right? So it's always bad. 
That's right. Um, so a couple things to note is, uh, so again, I can save this and I can save this. Anytime we save server-side technology, this restarts, like we said. Um, let's test it on, on uh, local host 3000. So again, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to refresh. Now I'm going to get this not found uh, because I'm looking for user 25. If I just do something that looks like this and press enter, I'm going to get express. That makes sense. This is a great place to put things up on GitHub. I've got a working version of my express um, scaffold. You guys should be getting this too. Does anyone not have this? I'm going to put it up on GitHub and you'll be able to look at it to your heart's content in a second. All right. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to put this up on GitHub for you guys. If you couldn't follow along quick enough or whatever, that's totally cool. Let's do this together. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code and here I am. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to skip out of this for a second. I'm going to stop the server. And just like I did before, let's talk about the commands. What's my first command? Let's refresh. Get in it. Get in it. <laughs> I did that twice. Get add dot. Remember? Okay. I only have 11 files. This is a good sign. It means that my git ignore file worked. Otherwise, it would have had like 400 files, right? Because of all the stuff I just installed. Um, so git commit minus m, and the, the convention is initial commit or first commit. And then what I want to do is I want to create a new repository in the cloud. So I'm going to go to GitHub, right? And I recommend you do this with me because today there's going to be a short exercise where you um, upload your links. And we'll talk about it later on, what I'm looking for. But I'm going to go to Centennial College here and create a new repository, which is going to be comp 308-w2019. And it's going to be lesson 3b. Let's enter at this point. It's going to give me a little bit of code at the bottom of this one, which is going to be the Git remote. And I'm going to push. So I'm going to copy this one. Go back to my Visual Studio code. Right click if you're a Windows person and enter. If you're not a Windows person using a Mac, you've got a command C on your GitHub uh, repos page. And command V, command is, is control for Macs. And you'll do that right here in, in the terminal, in, uh, and then it'll do the same if it'll have the same effect. All right. Um, so as you can see now, I've pushed to GitHub successfully, and if I go to my GitHub repository and refresh, we're good to go. All right. We've got our GitHub repository going. Um, now you can look at it. Good. Okay. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. So yeah, we made this work. And it's fantastic, but there's some things we got to talk about. Let's think about this. So one thing is we create something called an error. So uh, we require HTTP errors. This is a new thing, relatively new for um, the Express generator. We also have the Express. We require Express. And by the way, why am I looking here and not in Server.js? Because if you notice, Server.js right, requires app.js, right? So really, app.js comes first. Even though server.js is called server, it actually injects the app.js part right here. Theoretically, you can have had just one file that did everything. Um, here, they've broken it up because they want to hide the particulars from a server perspective. Um, I think from a learning perspective, it's good to do it like this, have a server.js and an app.js. And later on, if you want to compartmentalize or put it in a config folder or something else, you can. Um, we also have a couple of other things. We have the debug. Um, that we allow us to connect to, as well as our HTTP server. So the server JS, all it really does is it sets up the old school Node.js server, which is exactly what's happening down here, right? Whereas my app.js does all the other heavy lifting. For example, it creates an express object. It adds uh, the path uh, capability, so I can add things to the path. It does cookie parser in the background body parser. It creates a logger so we can you know, keep track of uh, stuff that's going on in the application. Um, and then we get to this part on line seven and eight where it creates two routers. One is an index, index router, which is the main route that you hit when you go to your index.html page or the root of your application. And what it does is it says require. Whenever you see the require, think about us injecting code at that particular location and then inflating it, right? So if you look there, we can see that we're injecting routes index. That means I got to go to routes 
index right there. And what's happening here is, again, we instantiated object of type express. And this time we create a smaller, instead of an app, we create a express router. Here we've got one path and we're saying, okay, cool. We're going to, on the, on the home route, what we're gonna do is we're going to render the index.ejs page and we're going to inject a variable called title with uh, some value of express into that page. I may have said it too crazy, but let's do this again. So here's my root. For this root, I want to go to index. So I go to views and I go to index. And this is my view. This is where my HTML page is. Okay. So now you see that there is a variable and there is some a directive that maybe you've never seen before. It looks like this less than percent equals, and then the name of the variable and percent greater than sign. Anything that's inside of here, what it's gonna do is it's going to inject the value of the variable inside of this particular part of the HTML template. This is not a file. So that's how, I, that's how it works. So literally what's going on is the view engine will parse this entire EJS file as one template string. That's what it does. And it looks through each one each line, and then it injects, if you see the directive like this, less than percent equals, it injects a, the, the variable in here. So notice what we did on our page, when, we're going, when we went back out, we literally have express welcome to express. And the reason for that is because it says express welcome to express, where we inject the express data the string into these three places, okay? And that's being done through the router. So the router basically says, okay, cool. So on this route, go to the index.ejs page and make sure you inject this, um, this variable title. Is everyone clear on that? So actually what's happening is there is no index.html or HTML pages. They're dynamically generated, right? So we take data, and the template smash them together and create a page. That's what happens um, at a very high level. Does this make sense? Routing. Okay, so we're going to get back to this in a bit. How about this, users? I got no purpose for this whatsoever. Notice I didn't even change the vars because guess what I'm going to do? Delete. Right? I'm just going to go here and delete this for now. We're going to get rid of users altogether. No more users. But that's going to cause a problem. Because in my app.js, I require it. This is a dependency. And on line eight of my app.js, I'm just going to get rid of that. Get rid of users. What this does is it will cause an error further down. All right. So now we're going to skip down to line 12 on the app.js file. It says app.setViews. And what we want to do is we're going to do something called path join dir name. Dir name under under underscore underscore dir name is a global variable that captures the directory name of your project, right? That's what it does. So you don't have to do it for yourself manually. You don't have to worry about pathing, absolute pass, relative pass. You just include dir name with the path.join and it says, so join the views folder with my directory path, wherever I am. So I can always have access to it. I don't have to reference it in some random way. I also specify that the view engine we're gonna use is you Yes, you can also specify other view engines. We're using the logger like I talked about before with a dev dependency. We're not going to get there right now. I'm just specifying what it is. Um, we're also going to encode and decode um, our JSON data when we need to. We're going to use a cookie parser to parse cookies and keep track of sessions if we want to. Right now, we're not going to. And this part is key. Um, express static, what it does, it creates a static path that includes the public uh, folder. So anything in the public folder is instantly in the path. I don't have to go dot slash public slash scripts slash app.js. I don't have to do that. I just, I just have to say scripts slash app.js. All right. So it removes that dependency. In fact, what I want to do is copy this line for now. And I'm going to add node modules to the path too, because we're going to need them in a bit. We're going to remove that later. I'm going to do this node module stuff. So I'm actually including node modules in my path. Why? Because I'm going to be doing bootstrap. And bootstrap, remember, we're going to use node for that. So I'm going to take node, font awesome, and jQuery and put them inside node modules. Later on, we're going to refer, reference them in the cloud with the CDN, Content Delivery Network link. 
as opposed to uh, direct access that we're doing here. Okay, on line 22, we're good because it's saying A for the root uh, folder, anything in all uh, root-based links, so top level, top level links, go to index router. And we know that index router points to this uh, roots index, right? But now, well, this is kind of defunct. It says, okay, for all users uh, f links or requests, go to the user's router. No, <laughs> we're just gonna get rid of that too. All right, so we don't need that. And then we're gonna talk about custom error handling. We're gonna have a 404 error. Um, we're gonna talk about this later, but more or less, one thing to note is uh, by default, the environment that we're working with is the development environment. We can switch this to um, the deployment uh, level or build type environment. And when we do that, uh, what we're actually going to be doing is switching between using localhost and port 3000 to whatever the server gives us. Example, if I wanted to take this site and put it on Microsoft Azure and I said, no, you must give me port 3000, Microsoft Azure is going to say, no. We're not going to give you port. Port 3000 is for just for you? What about for the other million people that use my Microsoft Azure services? No, we can't do that. We'll give you a spe specific IP address, not localhost ever. They never give you access to that uh, with your own custom port, whatever that's going to be. So this uh, environment stuff, the environment variables, gives you an option to swap out whatever the typical port is with the environment that's provided to you uh, by your provider. So example, in server.js, we have this process.env port or 3000, whichever one I get. If I if I can do this first, that means I've uh, my, my provider has given me a, an environment port number. I don't have to specify. It's a global variable that I tap into, right? And Or if it's not available, then I use 3000 locally. That's what I can do. Okay, so that's what this does. Um, and then, really, I'm ready to go. Let's see what that does. I'm going to save everything again. Um, notice that one of the challenges we had earlier today was that there was a bunch of files opened. And um, one of the students said, I don't know why, but it, it craps out. I can't, I can't use NodeMod. Sometimes we, do, we make changes and we don't save. And so we must save. Um, so we save everything. And we're going to go back out to control backtick. And we're going to start. Uh, we're going to kick off NodeMod again, and we still get we're okay. NodeMod says we're good to go. I'm going to go back to localhost, and if I refresh, you can see that I'm good to go. Notice also that I get it in the title up here. I also get it here and here. Um, what if I what if what if I wanted to do some other kind of routing? Like I went um, I don't know what about the about page? It's going to say eh. I don't know what that is. I don't know the about page link. Right. So if I want to create links or routes to the other ones, let's do it together. I want to make like that five, those five pages that you need for your assignment number one. Right. So I'm going to go back to your routes. So again, under routes, the routes folder, I'm going to go to index.js. And under my index.js, I'm going to copy paste a little bit. So this is my home page. And let's create the routes that I need for the other ones. So this one, and then I'm going to make my about page, products, services, contact. Okay. How do I do this? I'm going to put in, so get the about page. So it'll be slash about. I'm still going to use the index.ejs link, the template. But instead of the title being expressed, the title is going to be about. Here in the title, if instead of the, the home page being expressed, it's going to be home. And I'm going to change the um, this one to products. I'm going to say products. And this will be products. So I'm just changing the variable here very simply. And the last one will be Services, our second last one is services. Services, go. Here's services as well. So I'm actually def defining my path. These are all the paths that I'm, I'm listening for. Here's services. And at the bottom, I'm going to have contact. So this will be the contact page. 
Okay, so there I have all the pages that I want. Okay, how does this work? Well, now that I've done this, if I press control back tick, you can see that the router's restarted because I've changed server-based stuff. When I change anything server-related, NodeMon restarts my stuff, my, my, my server altogether. And on that, if I go back to my, um, my page and if I press refresh, you can see now that it says about, welcome to about, and the title says about too. Are you with me? If I click the other ones, if I say, I want to get my contact page, put a contact in here. And I press enter, it's going to say contact. But if I put something else, like index.html, right, it's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no clue what you want. There's no index.html here. We haven't defined a root for that. So in its simplest form, when we look at it, uh, when it comes to routing, we create a routing table. Now, this routing table is pretty limited in what it can do for us, right? But um, what it does do, it sets up paths for each of the of the areas that I want to access on my site. We could still set up a, you know, some kind of wildcard that captures all things that you don't know about and creates or create a custom 404 error page that says, oops, you stumbled. There's no nothing, you know, the you know, you're not the we're not the droids you're looking for or whatever it's gonna be, right? Um, and they've done that in other sites. You can do that. And you can also create static routes. So if I, if I want to look at a, a group of pages, it's going to be public. I don't care about the protection level. Then I can just use a static route without any kind of control, and it'll show all those pages immediately. So I don't have to do any of this custom switching stuff. Custom switching like this is when I want to have control over how my page is going to look, right? I want to control... Um, you know, the type of get request I'm making, whether it's a, a get request, a post request, uh, you know, a put, a delete, one of those kinds, right? And how uh, that is going to be viewed or used inside uh, my web application, all right? Okay, this is a great place to take a small break. I think I've talked my brains out for a bit. Um, so I'm going to go into my the GitHub tool that's inside Visual Studio Code here. Um, I have a few different changes. I'm going to click this plus button, which adds these objects to the staging area. And I'm going to say something like added Express.js. Uh, support. It's really a project restructure more than anything else. I'm going to click this check mark. And what it's going to do, I'm going to click the push uh, inside the ellipses. I'm going to go to push. And this is going to push uh, all my changes to online. So let's take a short break. When we come back, I want to hit that PowerPoint just a little bit more in terms of explanation. And then we're going to get right into incorporating Bootstrap and Font Awesome into our web application and uh, also using a little bit of EJS to do some switching on the navigation bar in terms of our breadcrumbs. Where are we? How do I, how do, I uh, do that um, using EJS? Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a short break. Let's take uh, 10. You want more time? All right, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, let's take 10 or 15, and when we come back, we'll continue, right? So, like, um...